Perfect. Hey, y'all. This is Stephen Van Camp and Lewis. And today uh, I have Francisco Miranda with me to chat about, of all things, actually, Catacetum denticulatum. Um, I think certainly myself and probably most of the folks watching this know uh, Francisco Miranda as the, the owner and purveyor of, of uh, Miranda orchids there in Florida. And he brings in a lot, a lot of Cattleyas, really nice Cattleyas from Brazil. Uh, but Francisco is also a taxonomist who has described uh, a bunch of catacetums, and one of those is Catacetum denticulatum. And I know that a lot of us, including myself, I mean, Fred Clark in, in California has, has difficulty growing this one. So I'm hoping that Francisco's uh, discussion and, and some photographs of the habitat can help us understand how to grow this one a little better. But before we get into that, uh, I want to introduce Francisco and, and Francisco, please tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself, your, your business and your taxonomic background. Okay. Thanks to Steve. Great to be here. And, uh, well, I started actually growing orchids at the same time I was interested in, in their taxonomy around 1979. And in 1981, I moved to the Amazon. I stayed actually two periods there, the whole year of 81. Then I came back to Eastern Brazil in 82, when I started uh, looking for Rupiculus lelis. Then 83, I went back. So the Amazon and stayed there until 85. So that's when I started my master's degree in, in orchid taxonomy. And the main subject in the Amazon was obviously Caracetum because this is one of the most widespread genera in the Amazon, I mean, of orchids. So between Caracetum, Maxillaria, and Pleurotilis, these are basically the most uh, widespread uh, genera of orchids in the Amazon. So Caracetum is very interesting for, for many reasons, and that's why it, they got my attention. First of all, because they have these um, separate male and female flowers. So they have a very different morphology between the forms. And also because there's so much variation in, in, in so many different species in the Amazon. Now, uh, then when I came, came back to Eastern Brazil, I started looking for catalysts in different regions. And I found out that, that uh, basically they grow under different conditions from the ones from the Amazon. One thing that uh, most people, at least here in Florida, think about caracetums is that they have to have a very well-defined growth period and a very well-defined rest period. This is very true for the species in central Brazil, where, where there is a very long dry period in the year, but not so much from, uh, regarding the ones on the coast and especially not the ones in the Amazon. And Francisco, uh, can we pause yes. there for a sec? I know that uh, you know, a lot of people out there think of Brazil and they think of the Amazon and that's it. But that, that is so not true. Can you spend just a, a minute telling us about the fact that Brazil has a wide range of different ecosystems where orchids grow? Oh, definitely. That comes back to my first picture here. Okay. This is a, a map of South America and also a map of Brazil highlighted in color. This is what... Uh, but well, it's a relief map, but this one is colorized for vegetation. So you can see that everything in dark green is tropical rainforest. And everything in more yellowish to brownish tones is very dry forest. We're going to see a little bit more in the dry regions of Brazil when we talk about the Cardinal Billiards. But essentially, we, we have, a, regarding Catacetons, you have basically three growing climatic conditions for caracetums. You have the ones in, that come from the Amazon, the ones that come from the drier central Brazil, and the ones that come from the strip on the coast. The conditions are different because, for example, in the Amazon, there is a, a dry season, but a dry season is not very dry. It's not like a no rain at all. Might be a few days without rain, but uh, central Brazil, for example, we have areas that you have a dry period of eight, nine months. And this fits more with the, the, the narrative that people have about caracetons, that caracetons need a very a lot of water in the growing season, and then they have a long dry period. Some people even take them out of the pots, put them in the fridge or whatever, just to try to make the plants stressed and especially dry. But this might work okay for the species that come from central Brazil, but not from the ones in the Amazon. The ones in the Amazon are usually adapted to a more uh, continuous growth throughout the year. And uh, if you can see my mouse cursor here, this is the state of Rondonia, 
in the southern part of the, the Amazon region in Brazil. You notice the Amazon region actually extends to neighboring countries like uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. But we are talking just about Brazil here. So the state of Rondonia here is together with the, with the country of Bolivia, okay? And this is the southernmost part of the Amazon. We start to have a little bit of elevation. It's not just a very plain, low-level, flooded area. So as a result, you have a little bit of a dry period, but this is just weeks in the year. So the species still need more water. And you have to remember that Caracidium denticulatum is one of the very small species, actually one of the smallest ones in terms of uh, growth habits. So these are plants that don't have a lot of reserve. So if you give them a too long of a dry season, you're going to kill the plants. And this, I think, is the main reason why people have difficulty growing. Denticulatum tigrinum, which is another species with a very small flower that I can show later too. Actually, there is a natural hybrid between the two. And uh, essentially, I think this is the main, the main reason why people kill the species from the Amazon, because they give them too long of a dry period and the plants are not adapted to that. Of course, for you to know that, you have to know where the species come from. And for that kind of stuff, we need more information. I mean, more written or internet information about that. Because I don't think anybody knows all the species to be able to, to do that. Anyway. Yeah. Actually, so, uh, Fr Francisco, can you, can you tell us a little bit about, so you're, you're right, most people do think of of growing catacetums and giving this sort of long extended dry rest. How much rainfall are they getting in these sort of, oh, oh, is it is it that the dormant season is very short? Or is it that yeah. they're getting a little bit of rain okay? Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a dormant season. You see the state of Hondonia here, we start getting close to some of the drier areas, which essentially here in more slightly higher elevation. So we have spots here in the state of Rondonia that you can get uh, no rain for a period of time. And as you get more to the to the eastern part of the state, it starts getting even a little bit drier because it starts going up a hill and more cl closer to the areas that are, that are drier. So during, the, let's say, spring and summer, you have to remember that the seasons are opposite to the ones in the northern hemisphere. So we are actually in Brazil, now we are in the winter, <laughs> getting into the spring very soon. And uh, there is a lot of water in the spring, and especially in the summer, there is rain every day, essentially. So the plants need plenty of water during spring, summer, and even some part of the fall. We start just cutting the water, I would say, for the species in the southernmost part, the species from Rondonia. I would say by the end of the fall and in the winter, I wouldn't recommend you removing the plants from the pots because they're going to damage the roots and the, the roots essentially what is or what keep the plants alive. I mean, for all the species from the Amazon, and you have to remember, more than half of the species of Caracetum come from the Amazon. And uh, so most of them need uh, water throughout the year. And you just get the water a little bit in the winter, essentially. And, and so, so I would say that in the summer, it rains every day. Yeah. So, so, so our, our summertime care would be the same, or let's say, for example, I grow in the PET method, where it's got a little, little reservoir of water in the bottom. Um, but so during the, but it's the winter time where you're thinking, keep the to keep the humidity high, and then maybe uh, add a little bit of water every now and then, a little more often than let's say. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and don't yeah. don't expect the plants to stay dry for long periods of time because especially the ones with small, the smaller plants can die. Species with the, that produce bigger plants, like Arsene saccatum, for example, they can survive dry droughts, longer droughts, because the plants have a lot of reserve. Doesn't doesn't mean they like it, but but they can survive. But the small plants like uh, Denticolat, Antigreen, or Rondonense, these are real small plants. These definitely don't like don't like uh, long dry periods. And, and do you have any any photos of, of the habitat itself? Yes, I do. Let me uh, stop sharing this one and share the next one. And, and while you're doing that, if you could sort of frame up, uh, just sort of give us a story of how how you were you were out there and you were discovering this this new species. Oh yeah, the, you see, in in eighty one, I went to I went to the Amazon just to work on a on a a plant nursery actually, and I came back in the end of the year, and then I I haven't started my master's degree at that time, okay? 
and I just uh, started traveling around the eastern Brazil to, and then that's what really started my interest in in, in taxonomy, really. And uh, when I went back to the Amazon in '83, I went to work in the what they call uh, Project Polo Noroeste, which is essentially the the north northwest part of the Amazon. They were doing floristics and all this stuff. We have a uh, we were, were based in Manaus, but we have lots of, in the IMPA, which is Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas da Amazonia, we have lots of uh, Americans working as scientists. So there was a very eclectic group of, group of people working in all, all areas of, of science, of plant science and animal science in, in, in the Amazon. And then I did a, a big trip, a one month trip to the state of Rondonia, uh, which I had at the time very little floristics evaluation. And you see that picture here, for example, this is one of the first BRs, which is it was one of the federal roads open in, the, in, in Rondonia. Remember, that was 1983, exactly 40 years ago. Mm, yeah. A long time. Yeah. And you look now at, uh, you look at Google Earth, that, that uh, road now is paved with lots of houses, gas stations, everything. There's a city there, it's well developed. Oh, wow. So probably all these, I have to go there one, one day to, to see how things are, see if you still can find those, those plants there. But probably all these uh, palm trees and all this kind of more dryish forest is probably gone by now. I, I really don't know. Because when I left the, the Amazon in 85, I thought I was never going to go back there. And three years ago, I went there and I still found Cattle Dorados and all this stuff. Most of the stuff that I used to see, I still could find. Huh. Which means I still have some hope that I can find plants here. But essentially, we were collecting lots of calicidiums here. Calicidium denticulatum was not found by me, it was found by my good friend Kleber Lacerda, because Kleber was a, a doctor, a tropical disease doctor in the Amazon. I met, uh, I met him first there, and he lived in the Amazon for, I think, 17 years, and he oh. was always interested in orchids. So he collected a lot of these calicidiums. And uh, we actually described a few by myself, and then we described uh, quite a few other species together. Okay, yeah. because I had... Yeah. And, and, and Francisco, I, I, I just want to tell everybody that I, I've been reading this book by by uh, uh, Dr. Lacerda as well, and, and you're a co-author. Yeah. I'll, I'll show a picture here uh, of this book, and it, it's really cool to read, and, and it, it has a great description and some tips and tricks of, of how to grow some of these these plants from the Amazon, including Dicticulatum and a whole bunch of these catacetums. I, I didn't realize just how many catacetum names have your name next to them uh, as, as <laughs> describers. Yeah, I was very active the first few years when I left uh, when I left uh, the Amazon. But you see, I moved to the US 24 years ago almost. And uh, all my materials were there and I'm here, so I couldn't do any more taxonomy work. So I did a couple, a couple of descriptions only throughout all these 24 years. But I still have a lot of type specimens with me that at my mother's house in Brazil, just waiting oh. to be worked on. Maybe one day I'll have a chance to do that. I don't know. <laughs> because bringing the materials to the US will be an option, but then I have to go through CITES and all this stuff. I never did that. I have to look for a, for a university here to be able to do the import. It's kind of complicated matter, so I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. I thought about doing it this with Selby Gardens, maybe. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it in the, the last 10, 15 years, really. That, that's that's interesting. And, and so so uh, I know a lot of the catacetums grow on palm trees, but was, was denticulatum sort of specific to one group of palm trees, or was it kind of all over the place? Well, no, mostly uh, Kleber found them on, on palm trees, as far as I remember. I think if you want, if you want to get to the more more detailed information, that book that you have is probably ideal because he's the one that wrote the chapter on the Amazon. Yeah. So, and I and I know that I, I'm starting to forget things because, especially that road here, I thought it was in a different location. When I look at my handwritten notes of the trip 40 years ago, yeah, I mean things are completely different from when I was thinking a couple of years ago. You know. Yeah. So many years I start to confusing things. So that's a, a good reason to, to write the notes when you when you do field work, or at least use a tape recorder, whatever. Today you use digital recording, it's much easier. But even for you to know exactly what time of the year, the dates you collected the material, because today when you take a picture, it comes with a date and 
the day you took the picture, but in the past, I have the slides. Look at those slides 20 years later. When was that that I took that slide? Yeah, Which month yeah. was that? If you don't, if you don't write it up at the time, you're going to forget it. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. so that's the, that's the the Stolen Colosseum. As far as I remember, he found those plants together with the green in some of these palm trees that you can see here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have more more pictures that I can show you. Okay. Right. That's kind of a low resolution picture, but uh, that's what I could find quickly. See, this is one of the Colosseum identical. That was the actually, I think this was the first one that Kleber found, which I think is still the nicest one. <laughs> Very colorful. <laughs> And uh, but you can see the size of the flowers are about one inch, well, a little bit bigger than an inch tall. Look at the size of the bulbs. I think those bulbs are one, one, one and a half, two inches tall maximum. It's a small species, yeah. so it's one of those plants that don't like to stay dry. I mean, they just disappear, they shrivel and die. And they have to be well rooted for you to allow them to flower. That's that's another thing, uh, Francisco. Do you think that, um, this is one of those species that will probably need high air humidity as well. Um, because you know, I know a lot of folks that they grow catacetums, it's probably the ones from central Brazil or other ones that have a strong uh dry period. Um, and they grow them inside, and it's you know, the, the inside humidity in the United States is 20 percent during December, January, February. Do you think this is one that might need uh, some elevated humidity during the the, the winter rest? Yeah, so I'd say so. If you if you move the plants inside, especially in the winter, you have to move them inside anyway, unless you have a greenhouse. Yeah. But I would keep them a little bit more moist. So I wouldn't let them stay like 20% for too long. And but I found that, for example, in Florida here. Just, just to finish that, in Florida here, even with air conditioning, I can't go below 50%. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just so darn hot. Right now, I mean, I had the air conditioning going. Inside the office here is 83 degrees. I can't go below that. Oh wow! Because it's 97 outside, <laughs> and humidity outside is like 50 percent, so it's darn hot. Yeah. But uh, what you're going to ask about uh, temperature? Do you think this one will be cold sensitive? I would say that most of the species from the Amazon they don't go in the habitat. They don't go below like 17, 18 Celsius. Mm -hmm. But I would say like 65, 60 to 65. I think that's the minimum they would like. And again, a small plant like this, it, it's tricky because if you try to water the plants too much and it gets colder, you're going to get rot yeah. because the plant is not growing. But the thing is that uh, when you take the plants inside, it's not going to be very hot anyway because you have the air conditioning. So if you keep the temperature around uh, 65, 70, and you it around 40%, I think that would be ideal for the winter time. Okay. Perfect. I, I wouldn't go below that because I know I have some a few calicinums growing here, and one of the species I have growing is Calicinum galeritum, is the is the one from the southern Amazon. Mm -hmm. They definitely don't like the winter. Yeah, the plants are just starting. I mean, of course they have to rest, but because they are in the Amazon, they don't from the Amazon they don't rest much. So if you keep watering them, they start producing new growth, and the roots get all black spots and, and they lose the leaves, which is a killer for calicinum. Because you see, when the new growth is developed, you want to keep it clean and growing. Mm -hmm. If you start getting fungus or bacteria infection on the leaves, that's it probably for the plants. Interesting. Okay, so that's one. Let me let me show another one. Yeah. Okay, that's the second one here. Oh wow. Very colorful too. Mm -hmm. But uh, the spotting here is much smaller. It's more like a peppery spotting. And uh, this is the second one he found. I think these are the two plants that we, we we had to work with by the time of the descriptions. And how how common is the hybrid between uh, Tigrinum out in this area? As far as I know, Kleber found only one. Let me show the Tigrinum and, and also the hybrid yeah. really quickly. I have pictures of both of them. Okay, that's Tigrinum here. Yeah, this, this, it's it's a really interesting looking species, and actually, it's it's one that um, Fred Clark sells pretty regularly. So, everybody yeah. who's, who's watching this and is drooling over this, you can probably get them from Sunset Valley orchids fairly regularly. Yeah, this is a is, and for some reason I found that this one is a little bit easier than the Chocolato. Mm -hmm. Maybe the plants get get a little bit bigger. The the flower spike is longer. The the flowers are not as 
as bunch, you know, they're a little bit more separated on the spike. Yeah. But uh, let me show the hybrid now. Okay, that's a hybrid. And uh, it's interesting because the artificial hybrid has been uh, registered. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then, but the natural hybrid was never described. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never had a chance to describe that. We That's... still have the materials, but it was never described, as so, far as I know. I mean, it's... the the hybrid is the Sylvie, right? Is that right? Sorry. It, what is the the hybrid's name? I'm I'm trying to. I think it's Dentig Dentigriano. Dentigriano. That's right. Not the yeah Dentigriano. And I don't know. It cannot be with the A Dentigriano because both. Uh, Denticolato and Tigrinum don't have an O in the end. So it has to be Dentigrinum, can be done, not Dentigrinum, but that's a natural artificial hybrid. You can give the name you want, actually. Right. <laughs> but if you describe a natural hybrid, you have to, to be a little bit more careful with the conventional name. Yeah. And actually, you don't need to use the same name for the natural hybrid and artificial hybrid. These are two different entities. Okay, so if this gets described, it's probably going to be a different, completely different name. And that is interesting to, to to note that because there are some species that do have, uh, for example, Brazilian jewel, which is, um, you know, has a natural hybrid. Uh, Atlea Brazilian jewel has a natural hybrid, and then of course uh, the artificial name is uh, is different than the natural hybrid name. Oh yeah, that that that's that's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but usually the natural hybrids are described first. Yeah, <laughs> they're found first. In, in in that case, actually, we found that plant like. 40 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Kleber found that plant 40 years ago. So it was way before anybody was working with calicetons in cultivation. I mean, nobody had it, those things at That's the time. Really cool. But I'm glad to see that they are, they are popular because uh, many of the species are, are kind of difficult to, to preserve because for you to make, to, to reproduce the species, you have to have several plants of the same species. And that's one thing about caracetins, it's so easy to make a hybrid because one got, one has male flowers, the other species has female flowers, you just cross one in the other with the other, and that's it. Yeah. But if you try to reproduce the species, it's way more tricky because you have to have several plants to be able to have two, one with male flowers and the other with female flowers at least probably nearby the same time. You know, it's, it's kind of it's more complicated. But some people still do it, which is good. I hope to have to see more of these artificially propagated. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see quite a few of the, the Brazilian growers uh, are, are are making a lot of these these hybrids and actually they seem to be collecting some from the wild. So they're getting the wild ones and, and line breeding some of these these hybrids. And, and I'm, I'm really excited for them to come north to, to the United States one of these days. So ho hopefully hopefully we can see those here in our collection soon. Hey, one day I, I told you I want to go to that that trip into the Nobel habitat because I'm because I'm restarting those tours. But mm -hmm. I really want to make sure that the places are still there, you know? Yeah, for sure. Just to make sure that we can still see the plants. Because one thing I hate to do is to take people to places where you get there and there's nothing, you know? It's just a 7-Eleven. <laughs> exactly. So I just want to make sure that uh, and mo most, of the, most of the places I know they are still there. Mm -hmm. But for example, the, the habitat of Nobilers, the last time I was there was 2009. So that's almost 15 years ago. So we need to do a trip there to see really what you can still see, because there are not that many species there. We're going to see that later. Now this that uh, but they have now is just basically the way they grow. This is not Tenticulatum, okay? This is one of these Barbaton types. Mm. But this is the, the type of habitat you're going to find all these. See, this is a small plant also. The small, the, the species of Calisthenes that produce small plants tend to grow in palm trees that have more more like a, net, a netting material, see, that holds more organic matter. Yeah. So the plants stay more protected. Many of the big... And so so that, that netting is going to capture the water and all the organic material and create this... Exactly, exactly. And it stay, stay for many years there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the large large plants, calcium produce large plants, they tend to, they can grow more on like the bark of the trees. Yeah. Like you see with Sakatum and uh, Spitzii and many of those big ones. Yeah. Because they, the conditions get drier in, in, in the dry season, but those plants produce so, 
such big root systems mm -hmm. that they can uh, cope with the drought very easily. Not so much with the small small plants, no. Well, th this is very valuable information for for folks out there who, who are listening, kind of have trouble denticulatum. Some maybe some of the hybrids, um, and especially as some of these smaller Amazon smaller statured plants from the Amazon become more and more popular. Uh -huh. This type of information, I think, is really important for folks to know. And and Francisco, we only have a couple of minutes left. Do you? Is there anything else you want to say before we uh, before we wrap it up? And and I do want to tell everybody that our next video is going to be about nobilior, Cattleya nobilior. So um, that will be the next next. Yeah, I think we can probably go time. because th there's so much to say about Calasirans that uh, two minutes is not going to add much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, Francisco, I just want to say thank you for talking to us and giving us this really important information. And um, like I said, we're, we're going to, Francisco and I are going to do another talk about Cattleya nobiliora and its habitat. And I'll post that video next week. So um, I'm going to post a link here to Francisco's website and to his his uh, business. So I um, uh, appreciate the, the the Zoom call, Francisco, and the information. And, and we'll chat soon. Okay. Thanks. I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, bye.